NTV Wild Talk in partnership with the Kenya Wildlife Service and Wildlife Direct. Hello and welcome to NTV Wild Talk with me, Smriti Vidyarthi, coming to you from Watamu. Now this is going to be an interesting one because we are at Bioken Snake Farm, which means that this show is all about snakes. Now don't switch off your screens just yet because I am as freaked out and as nervous as some of you may be, but I really am willing to learn much more about these creatures because I hear that they are not all as bad as we think. So join me on this journey. Come with me. Hi, how are you doing? Very good. So this is Royan Taylor and he is the director of Bioken. Great to be here, Royan. I've got to say, I am feeling pretty nervous about dealing with snakes. Tell us first though, what exactly happens here at Bioken? Well, Bioken is a, is a research centre uh, specialising in, 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 in reptiles. Um, what we're really famous for is the, is the work that we do with snakes. So hopefully today, um, with a bit of time, I get to show you a bit of that and maybe change your, your, your perception of <laughs> these wonderful animals. How did you get involved, though, in managing a, a place like this and handling snakes? Well, it started um, really as a child. I, I started catching um, insects and animals as a small child. I grew up on a farm in Eldoret, in northern Kenya. And, um, as the years went on, I, I got more and more into catching reptiles and things. And then I, one day I walked into the house with a snake and, and my mother nearly <laughs> fell over. But um, it was a, it, luckily it was not a venomous snake. Um, it was a green grass snake. And, and as a result, she said, I think you need to, if you're going to fool around with these things, you need, some, you need to learn about what you're doing. So right. I met a very charismatic man called James Ash, who founded the, the snake farm here in 1980. Wow. Uh, I came down and spent time with him and, and we became very good friends. And, and many years later, he asked me to come and take over his, his work. And so in 2002, I took over as director here. What should I expect as we head into this farm? Well, Kenya is a wonderful country with many, many different types of wildlife and you know once you look at reptiles as well just as we have with birds there are very many different species leaving the, the the lizards and the crocodiles and the tortoises out just snakes we have about 126 different species of snakes in Kenya so we are blessed to have so many luckily most of these are not poisonous and they can do absolutely no harm some of them are and we do actually can boast some of the most venomous and the most um, dangerous snakes in the world. We have them even here. And here at the farm as well? Yes, we do. <laughs> All right, we will find out so much more in just a moment. Wish me luck. I have never handled a snake before. I have not even come this close to a snake, but I trust you and that's what you've got to do. So come with us. Caribou. Asante. Ooh, oh my! That one is right up at the window. <laughs> have a look there. So here Smriti is, uh, is, is the first of the snakes in, in the line of, of a whole load of snakes I'm going to show you. Um, don't be nervous, there is, there is decent glass here, they won't be able to get out and, and, and get you. Do you have any idea what snake this is? I have no clue, I have no clue. How can you even differentiate them? Well, there's no, there's no shortcut to how to tell a venomous snake from one that is and one that is not. Okay. So you actually got to learn them, which one is venomous and, and, and which one is not. Right. So this snake here is a large brown spitting cobra. Oh my goodness, this it's, is a cobra. This is the largest species of spitting cobra in the world. Um, Whoa. We were behind describing it. There's a picture here of, of one of the early photos that we did um, in 2007. Okay. And this is when we, we, we published it with Wildlife Direct. Mm -hmm. And um, what we were able to do is we were able to prove that this is a different species to the black neck spitting cobra, which was well known in, in Kenya before. Right. So basically all the lowland areas um, along the coast and into parts of Savo, Amboseli, northern Kenya, Samburu, you get this very large spitting cobra. Nice. Most spitting cobras pit out at about four and a half, five feet. These easily grow to six or seven feet. And if it's a spitting cobra, does that mean obviously it spits at its prey or why is it called that? So what they do is they, they spit, but only to defend themselves. Uh -huh. And so oh. they don't spit at their food, um, but what they do is they aim for the eyes. 
So if there's a cat or a mongoose or something causing it trouble, it will spit in the eyes. It's incredibly painful. And so then the animal will leave it, will leave it alone. So if that happens to you, it doesn't then attack you. It'll usually disappear off into the bush. A lot of people I've met who have been spat at in the eyes never actually saw the snake. Once it spat at them, they closed their eyes and then it disappeared. Oh, wow. But can it blind somebody? Um, it can if, if you need to be treated. Um, the, the treatment is very important to know is to wash the eyes out with lots and lots of water. Uh -huh. um, any bland liquid you can get hold of. So we usually say stick your head in a bucket and rinse the eyes mm. out or, or lie on the grass with a, with a hose pipe. Rinse all that venom out and then you'll, you, you'll be fine. If you don't, you can get all sorts of complications. Secondary infection can set in and there are cases where people have actually lost their eyesight as a result. Wow. All right. So this, the first, first snake that we're seeing is a spitting cobra. How dramatic. I'm sure you've got plenty more to show us. We have plenty. <laughs> There's a whole load of these. So these first few cages here are all large brown <laughs> cobras. I'm noticing that, you know, it's once in a while it's sticking its tongue out. Um, what does that mean? Why is it doing that? Well, you see, they can't smell with their nostrils. They actually, they smell with the tongue. The, the, the forked tongue will pick up scent particles from the air. Yeah. And then at the back of the, uh, of the top of the mouth, they have an organ called a Jacobson's organ. Uh -huh. And what that does is it allows it to taste air particles. And it's a much, much better sense of smell than, than ours. So these are large brown spitting cobras. Yes. What other cobras exist? Well, in Kenya, we've got five different cobras, three that spit, mm -hmm. the large brown, the black necked, and then in, in Savo and dry country, we have a red spitting cobra. It's oh. red, red in color. And then we have two that don't spit. We've got the forest cobra, mm -hmm. which is actually quite a rare snake, and the Egyptian cobra, again found in, in, in lowland countries around Amboseli, parts of the Rift Valley. They've also very, very difficult oh, snake to find. And they also look uh, very different in color. They look darker. Well, these, uh, these are black neck spitting cobras that okay. can also vary in color. They can be gray, they can be... These particular jet black ones mm -hmm. come from the sort of Maasai Mara into, into Serengeti. Okay, and, and I noticed, Royan, that, um, you know, on its head it's very shiny in color, but then on part of its body, it's sort of the skin is peeling. Explain that to us. Well, what snakes do is they shed their skin. As they grow, each time that they shed, they are slightly larger than they were before. So it's a way of keeping the skin in good condition. They get parasites like ticks and mites. They don't, they're unable to scratch them off because they don't have any hands. Yeah. And so what they will do is they, have, they, they shed their skin and in the wild, they would shed their skin, leave it in the bush and move on. So any parasites are left on that bush. So I often say to people, if they see a shedded skin in a bush near the house, it doesn't mean the snake is living in that bush. It probably right. means it's living further away. Because okay. where we have studied them, they never shed in the same place. In captivity, we have to be a little bit more careful and make sure we throw out the skins mm -hmm. as soon as they shed, just to control parasites ah. in, in, in a cage. Okay, interesting. Right, what next? <laughs> So what I'd like to show you here is, is, is some of our more common. So these are stripe-bellied sand snakes, and they, they vary in different areas from, from you know, the Rift Valley. They are quite striped like this. As you get to the, the coast, it's a much plainer color. Uh -huh. This is the, the, the northern stripe-bellied sand snake. It's called a stripe-bellied because it's a stripe down the inside of the belly. Right. Mm -hmm. um, this is the, 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 the eastern stripe-bellied. This is probably one of my favorite snakes. It's called a speckled sand snake. It gets its name from the spots on the belly. Yeah. I often say to people, it looks like a black and yellow hose pipe. Yes, it but does. But you'll notice the top of the head is oh, a sort of... Oh, gosh! Don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> the, the top of the head is a sort of brown color yeah. where it's white underneath. And this is probably the fastest snake in the world. Oh. People will say, oh, black mambas are very fast, but you know, in, 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 in our, in our, they are, but in our experience, probably the fastest snake you'll get is one of these, these speckled sand snakes. A big one like this can move very, very fast indeed. Wow. And there's a number of them. So, you know, all of these snakes, we do say to people, a point to remember is if you've got snakes that got stripes running across the length of the body, mm -hmm. in this part of the world, there, you, there are no snakes that could do you any harm. This is oh. a very sweet snake here. It's called a link mark sand snake. A sweet snake. Yeah, it gets okay. its name for the sort of chain marking on its, on its back. Yeah. And these ones you find along the, the, the coast. And so generally, the more lower in altitude you go, the more number of species of reptiles oh, because they wow. need warm weather. So in places like Nairobi, there are some snakes, mm -hmm. but you'll find that there's very few. As you go into Limuru and places like that, you find that there, there's not that many snakes. As you come down in altitude, as you go into the Mara, as you come into, you know, further down into Savo, mm -hmm. 
and, and, and especially along the coast, we, we have a huge diversity. Why do they need warm weather to, to thrive and survive? Reptiles are ectotherms, which means they can't create their own body heat like we mammals do. So oh. when we're cold, we put on a sweater yeah. and then you shiver and you create heat from inside. With reptiles, they need to get that from an external heat source. So oh. whether it's a lizard or a snake, you will see in the morning, they will come out and bask in the sun. Right. So like the sun is shining now, they pick up the heat from that. When it gets too hot, they'll go into the bush or they'll slide under a rock. All right, so these are more common ones. Yes. What's next? So Smriti, can I, can I interest you in trying to touch one of these snakes and see what they, what they feel like? I can promise you it's not venomous, so it won't, it won't hurt you in any way. Okay. I'll restrain the snake so you're... It won't come for me. No, 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 I'll, <laughs> I'll make sure I'm holding it in a way where it won't. Okay. But would, I'd like you to feel it so that uh -huh. you can feel for yourself and describe whether... Because a lot of people say they're slimy or they're not. Are, yes. Are you ready to see if you can... Oh, I see it. That. I see it here. What snake is this? So this is a rufous beak snake. Um, oh. If I ask Bonfas, my, if you can try and catch it from that side, because I don't think I can reach it from here. Oh, my. Oh, wow. Is there a particular way that they have to be handled and held? Oh. Actually, yeah, there is. If we just come out in the light here so that you can, you can see. Um, what, what I, how I describe it to people when we train snake handlers is that you need to hold the animal in the chest. Okay. So where's the chest because you can't see the hands. If you're holding it in the belly, it's going to want to move forward. If you hold it near the neck, it's going to want to move backwards. So the chest is really where the heart is and you can actually see it oh. going in and out here. This is where it's actually breathing from. Wow. So what we'll do is we usually put your hand on it that way. Okay. And if I show you from this end, mm -hmm. you, can, you can feel, I'll keep <coughs> the head side so that you don't worry. But if you just touch with your finger there and tell me how you feel about that. Okay. That, that, that scales there. Okay. Oh, geez. All right. Let me be brave and just get on with this. Oh, oh my. Yeah. Okay. It, you're right. I mean, a lot of people tend to think that snakes are very slithery and slimy and it's not. It actually feels like a beautiful texture. Yeah, they're very dry. You see, people think they're slimy, but they're not. And um, that allows the snake to go in yeah. and out of a, um, a puddle and, 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 not, and not get dirty, actually. They, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful way of, of moving through the bush. So they developed a way of moving through the bush really quickly without any hands and legs. I think it's really quite remarkable. Wow. And I mean, you know, having, I mean, touching this, Ryan, makes me think, and it's quite a sad thought, of how people, a lot of people buy products made out of snake skin. Why yeah. is that so popular? It just is because I, I guess it, it, it's cool, but it comes from an old, old way of thinking. In, in, in the old days, you know, they would, they would kill animals for their furs and yeah. skins. And, and, and sadly, half of, 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 of the world has lost its wildlife to such trades. It, right. it's, it's, it's certainly not sustainable. You couldn't, you couldn't grow these things in captivity to, to be able to sustainably produce that. So when we say we're a snake farm, we don't do skins, we don't do anything like that. In mm -hmm. fact, the only product we have is, is the venom that we get from the venomous snakes, yeah. which is needed to make anti-venom. It's also used in medical research, which I'll, I'll explain a little bit later. Okay, and as I look closer at its face, which is now facing you, where are its ears? Well, snakes have no ears. Really? Yep. All, uh, most reptiles do, but snakes and chameleons have no ears. So they don't hear at all? They don't, but they can feel vibration in the ground. Oh. So when, when we have surrounded a snake in a bush and three of us are trying to catch it, yeah. we can shout at each other, it's on my side, it's on my <laughs> side, <laughs> and, it and it can't hear. But if you, if you, so when people say, oh, make lots of noise, if you're walking in the bush, they don't mean, you know, screaming and shouting, yeah. they mean banging and thumping the ground. They can feel wow. that vibration and then they will, they will run away. Wow, this is amazing and I'll, look, I'm not doing so badly, I'll happily touch it one more time. Well, look, uh, Bonnie's over here, come over here, Bonnie. Um, you've been working here at BioKen, how long for and what's your role? I've been here for 10 years now. Wow. And um, I really love snakes. Why do you love them? I mean, not many people say them, so many people are, you know, afraid of snakes. How did you grow your love for them? At first, before, I mean, when I was very small, yeah. I did like snakes. Okay. I did like animals at yeah. large. And later after school, I joined a different profession. Uh -huh. 
And then when I was working in the Masai Mara, I got a friend mm -hmm. who is a fundi of snakes. Okay. He really introduced me because he like, found me handling snakes without knowledge. Ah. So he did actually ask the owners of Biokin mm -hmm. that I, they can save me from the dangers of snakes. Right. So they mentored me from there uh -huh. and I found that's my job. And how do you use what you learn here at work about snakes to educate uh, your, your family, your friends and the community around here? Yeah. Uh, th there is a challenge because not everybody likes snakes. Mm -hmm. Like now in my family, mm -hmm. I find some few people likes, others don't even like yeah. snakes. But they agree and, and support me doing that because once they allow me doing that and they, they call me when they, whenever they find snakes, <laughs> yeah. so they know that he knows what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And I find it easier to train them when I'm handling yeah. because if I'm removing snake from somewhere, so I can tell them, just leave it, I'll do my job. And from there, I'll handle it expertly. Yeah. And they, they take it from there. So somebody will come in and say, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. And then I will just give him. And if you are interested, I will take my time uh -huh. to give you the right steps on it. Okay, and have you ever been bitten by a snake? Oh. I have been bitten once okay. by a mole viper. That's the worst one. Wow. But for small snakes like harmless ones yeah. they can bite us so that's not a big deal wow. so the worst one is the mole viper which is painful swelling and no problem but that didn't stop you from working with snakes no it gives you some more experience on snakes and respect Oh, wow. Well, yeah. you know what? It's amazing to see someone like you doing Thank such you. a unique and fascinating job and really keep it up. Thank you. And um, I think in a while I, I might at some point be ready to handle one, but not just yet. So you can put that back. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, and so like all animals that you keep in captivity, whether you keep chickens or goats, very important, clean water, clean cages. They can go for long periods of time without food. Oh, okay. That's why when they eat, they gorge themselves in the rainy season mm -hmm. and then they can go for long times. In fact, in very dry areas, we have snakes estivate, which means hibernate like mm -hmm. they would in winter, but in the dry season. So they estivate through the dry season. The beginning of the rains, changes the air pressure okay. and then you get a lot of snakes that come out now they need to eat because mm -hmm. they haven't eaten for a long time you have lots of people are tilling the land and preparing for the rains so that's when you have a lot of human wildlife conflict problems ah. with snakes because the snakes are out they need to eat yeah. find a mate get all that done before the rainy season is over to go back in the ground people are also in the shamba they're either clearing right. preparing or laying and then so when they meet you get those snake bite problems. So the number of snake calls we get and snake bites do go up. So we say to people, be careful in that yeah. season, keep your eyes open, never walk around at night without a torch because mm -hmm. you can see shoes is important. Okay. I know most people run around without, but at night especially. And so, but just be more careful in the rainy season sure. because that's when there are more snakes around. So interesting. All right, there's plenty more. Let's have a look. So Royan, you mentioned that snakes need to mate at a certain type of year. How do snakes do that? How do they mate? Well, actually, they're very similar to birds. Reptiles are very similar to birds. So they actually have one vent that does, does everything. So at certain times of year, the, you know, males will look for females, females will look for males, like all, all, all wildlife does. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of combat sometimes between ma males fighting over a female. I mean, that's the <laughs> right. same all over the world. But, okay. Um, so they do. They then, they then mate and move on. You know, you know, some snakes um, give birth to live young uh -huh. and others lay eggs. So depending on what they do, like puff adders, Part of the reason they are so successful is because they don't need a fi to find a place to lay their eggs. Uh -huh. The female will keep the eggs inside of her, basically. And then, so they have, when we say live bearers, they have actually eggs, but they're not, they don't have shells. So she'll give birth, yeah. they will hatch at the moment that mm -hmm. she lays them, and they don't have to be incubated. And anywhere. how can you tell the difference? I mean, I'm just looking at this one here. It is bright yellow in color. It looks very inquisitive. It's almost as if it's wondering what we're doing here. Um, but how can you tell a male from a female? Well, that's, that's a little bit more difficult. Generally, you know, with all reptiles, the tail on the male is a lot longer. So if you turn a tortoise upside down mm -hmm. and you've got two tortoises, you can tell male and female because it's longer or mm -hmm. short. So obviously it takes a while to be able to tell the vent. On, on a reptile like this one, the belly scales 
have are single and the 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 after on, on the tail they are they are double oh, yes. and so you can see that so obviously there's one larger scale there and that's the vent yeah. so everything happens from from that point and but telling males and females in in captivity we can do it with a with a probe mm -hmm. um, it's got to be done very carefully and somebody that's been trained how to do it um, in the wild they know they know who males and females <laughs> are nature right. it's, it's just like yeah. that but we have a lot of different kinds of, of, of venomous snakes and people get confused by how, how do you tell this or that. You yeah. can generally say in Kenya we can break them into vipers, mm -hmm. which are the big snakes with long fangs. Mm -hmm. We have the, the mambas, which are, are tree snakes that move very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And then we have the cobras that stand. People know that. And often people make a mistake because it doesn't always stand. Yeah. Often it, if it's not in an aggressive pose, it doesn't need to stand. Mm -hmm. So that you can break it into those three groups and then there's, we have two of the back fang snakes that are medically important. One right. is the twig snake, which I'll explain to you. And this one here is a boomslang. Okay. In South African Dutch, it means Afrikaans, but the name is reserved across the world uh -huh. for it. You can tell it because it's got a really large eye. The yes, eye on the yes, head is yes. much larger than anything else. And this is a very important snake because there is only one antivenom for this snake. Wow. And the only place in East Africa that has it is us. Here wow. At All right. So speaking about anti-venom, we're going to talk much more about that in just a moment. You are watching NTV Wild Talk coming to you from Bioken Snake Farm here in Watamu. It is fascinating to get so up close to these snakes. But there is so much more when we return. Do stay with us. Welcome back to NTV Wild Talk with me, Smriti Vidyarthi, coming to you from Bioken Snake Farm here in Watamu. Now, behind me are some of the world's most venomous snakes. Royan, tell us more. Well, what we've got here are, are mambas. And, you know, mamba in Kiswahili means crocodile. But the correct term in English, a mamba is a, is a, is a snake, a very large venomous tree snake. And in Kenya, we have three species. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know about the Jameson's mamba, which is found in Western Kenya, mainly in and around Kakamega Forest and the uh. tea estates in that area. It's a green snake with a black tail. Along the coast, you'll get the green mamba. This is the Eastern green mamba. You can tell it's got that luminous green color, yeah. like the socks we used to wear <laughs> in the 1980s. Right. So and then, bright. And then we've got the black mamba, which is a much bigger, bigger snake. They grow maximum size about 12 to 14 feet. Average at wow. around eight, nine feet. So they're very big snakes. But the they're not black. Well, that's the first thing you'll notice is that they're not black. They, they vary in color, slightly more brown, slightly more gray, but they're definitely not black. The, the name black mamba comes because the inside of the mouth is black. Okay. They will always run away from you. Mm -hmm. They're not dangerous in that way. But if you corner it in your kitchen or, or, or in a pump house, and then just try to tr go and try and, and beat it with a stick or a broom. Yeah. If you get it wrong and it bites you, you can be in a lot of trouble indeed. Because mm -hmm. the, the venom of the black mamba is very, very fast acting. And you can, in some cases, within an hour easily, a snake like that can actually take somebody's life. So the importance wow. of having anti-venom nearby, yeah. a doctor that, you know, have its correct storage because mm -hmm. it needs to be kept refrigerated, make sure a doctor that has been trained and knows how to deal with snake bite is very, very important. Right, and would a snake bite just because it has been aggravated and, you know, someone's trying to kill it or it's just, you know, bad timing? You know what, a bit of both. You will find like, you know, in a, in a snake like a mamba, in every case that we've had a snake bite, it has been because the person was trying to kill the snake mm -hmm. or trying to catch it. Right. So it's snake handlers like myself that can get into trouble because you're putting yourself very, very close mm -hmm. to a dangerous animal like this. But it's people who, 
you know, what has happened in a number of cases, somebody has stoned the snake, it's gone into a log pile, they couldn't get it out. Then later that evening, a lady has come to collect firewood uh, for the house, right. and then the snake has bitten her because its back is broken. Right. But in a case like that, it is. But they don't go out and attack people for no reason. Okay. They will always run away. They're very difficult to catch because they're fast, fast. You mm -hmm. have to chase after them if you want to catch one. So. To be honest, it's, it's one of those snakes that bites very few people because you don't come into contact okay. with it like that. We're more likely to get into trouble with a snake like a puff adder that sits on the pathway. If you walk along at night, you don't see it, you kick it or jostle it with your foot and it will bite you. And so we get more bites from puff adders than any other, other snake in Kenya. That's incredible. Yeah. Now, you talked about anti-venom and why that is so critical. Yeah. So in just a moment, we're going to learn much more about anti-venom. So many, many people are very fearful about snakes, primarily because they are afraid of getting bitten by them. And Royan, you did say that some of those bites can be life-threatening. But anti-venom plays a big part in saving someone's life. What is anti-venom? Well, the simplest way to explain it, anti-venom is the name of the medicine that they will use to treat you with if you've been bitten by a venomous snake. Okay. So in simple terms, if a snake bites you, there's a particular venom from that species. So you need to neutralize that venom. And, and the, the best way that has been done for the last 50 odd years is for an anti-venom to be made. And what we do is we will milk a snake mm -hmm. to get its venom out. That venom is then desiccated, which we will freeze dried. And in a dried form, it is then injected into a large animal such as a horse. A horse. A horse. And from there they then are able, that horse over a period of 14 to 18 months will build up an immunity against that snake's venom. Wow. We then can extract, the, well we don't do it, but the guys who do, they extract the blood, separate the serum, which is a clear liquid, that's reduced in volume and packed in a 10 cc vial. So it's pure horse serum. Wow. It is then kept refrigerated because it can spoil. Mm -hmm. And when you're bitten by a venomous snake, you are given an anti-venom injection mm -hmm. of that, um, that anti-venom and it is given intravenously um, for the species that it bit. What, okay. what we've managed to do over a number of years now is produce a polyvalent anti-venom that n covers a number of different species. Right. So like the one I've got here is this SIMA, stands for South African Institute of Medical Research. Mm -hmm. It's produced by SAVP now, which is South African Vaccine Producers. Yeah. This is polyvalent snake anti-venom and okay. it will cover all the mambas, mm -hmm. the large vipers, and the, and the cobras, both spitting and non-spitting. Okay. So this is possibly the most important anti-venom to hold for people like us in East Africa. Right. So we stock this at the snake farm. Uh -huh. If I have an accident or someone, one of my staff does and is bitten by a snake, this is what we will use okay. and it works. Okay. There's a lot of problems in Kenya at the moment where we've had some substandard or anti-venoms that are not appropriate for our area. So if you use an anti-venom that's made for a snake in South America or made ah, for a snake in it India, it's work. not going to help you. So wow. it's very important. And what is really important is we need to produce the venom for them to be able to make anti-venom. We have a number of snakes that you need a monovalent or a specific anti-venom mm -hmm. for, but this is probably the most important one to stock and hold here. So essentially what you're saying is that to make anti-venom, you need venom from a snake. Correct. That's interesting. All right. So what is in this box because we're about to milk a snake and by milking you mean we're going to extract that venom yes. from the snake so um milking is the correct term mm -hmm. uh it doesn't mean we'll get a stool and, <laughs> and milk like, like a, a cow. cow okay but it's the correct venom for for, for removing venom from a snake and right. the way we do that is we have a a receptacle mm -hmm. we'll just call it a glass if you like yeah and we've put a, 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 a rubber plastic membrane on the top here. Mm -hmm. It's secured so it doesn't slip out. So the idea is we get the snake to bite into here so that it can squirt the venom inside. Okay. We then can return the snake and then that liquid venom is then, is then desiccated. Mm -hmm. And in that process, it is then used to make antivenom. All right, let's get on with it then. What kind of a snake do we have in this box? So I've got a puff adder because puff adders are, this, as I said, are snakes that bite more people than anybody else. And so as a result, it is a snake that people know well in Kenya and know is as a venomous snake. I'd like to milk this one, one, to be able to show you the fangs. The fangs are quite large. Um, and then on, on that basis, uh, once I've opened its mouth and showed you, you, mm -hmm. can, you can tell me what you... 
what you All right, think. so this is going to be interesting. Ryan is going to milk a snake and he's got his uh, colleagues and staff here as well because this is an exercise that is delicate and we have to be careful. Ryan has to be careful too. Yeah, so okay. if I can ask you just stand back a little bit while I open the box and, okay. and, and secure this snake. Oh, wow. So here we have a medium-sized um, puff adder. They grow really large. And I see you're using those tools that you've been walking around with the yeah, whole so morning. This is my, my snake stick. So just hold on while I secure the head. And why do you need to secure the head? Because you will see that the dangerous part of a venomous snake Ooh, wow. is, in, is in, the, in the head. If I can ask you to take the middle of the body there and just secure that there. So I just hold this? Yes, yes, please. Okay. That's fine. So if you just hold it still, mm -hmm. see, I need my hand free. That's why I need you to hold there so that I can actually get the, get the head. So don't well, worry. Are we I'm, in any sort of danger? While I'm holding it here, you're fine. So don't worry about that. Oh, Jesus! All right. I've let go of one hand. That's all right. Oh, my! This is... Don't worry, don't Not worry. Not quite what I expected. Oh, whoa. So you can see the, the fangs there. Yeah, and I could feel its body moving as well. So there's really long fangs. They're like a doctor's hypodermic needle at the tip. They're hollow, and the venom is actually injected out like that. So I'm mm. going to put this snake back. Ah. Hold on a minute, don't worry. So if I just take from your hand there. So I can let go? You can let go, thank you. I just move it like that. That bite was pretty intense. The snakes are venomous because they need the venom to kill a rat. Yeah. A rat is a dangerous animal if you don't have any legs. Right. So if you go and try and grab hold of it, it'll turn around and bite you. So what a snake like that will do wow. is bite, inject a small quantity of venom and, and move away. Okay, can I pick this up? Yeah, sure. So this sort of little bit of liquid in here is venom. That and is, by venom, we mean that poison. That is the raw puff adder venom. Wow. And depending on the size of the snake. So I didn't, you saw there, I just let it bite. Mm -hmm. When we do it commercially, I'll actually, I'll actually massage the venom glands very gently okay. to push a little bit more venom out. Right. So what we would do is we would milk maybe 10, 20 snakes in the same container. You usually can't get much more because by then there's enough holes at the top that it's not really working very well. Yeah. And so we build up a small quantity of venom like that. That then then goes in a petri dish and it goes in the dryer. So once we've dried it, it looks a little bit like soap flakes mm -hmm. or sugar crystals depending on the species. And then it is in that form that it is then taken off to do. And they use it for two things. It's used in medical research mm -hmm. and it is also used in the in the production of anti-venom. So you need snake venom to make, to make, to make anti-venom. Anti-venom. Wow, that is so interesting. But of course, definitely do not ever try that on your own or at home. All right, so much more to discuss in just a moment. All right, so I've calmed down a little bit after that episode with the puff adder. But, Royan, you're about to show me even more venomous snakes. What are these? A lot of people don't understand how important I, it is to conserve reptiles. Um, and my, my opinion on that is I don't think that we can conserve reptiles only. We have to conserve everything in the wild. And I wanted to show you a couple of really rare, special Kenyan snakes. Oh. Now, there are three venomous vipers that are found in Kenya and nowhere else. You can't find them in Uganda, Tanzania, anywhere else in the world. In the world? In okay. the world. Wow. So the first one is a Kenya horned viper. This looks like a small puff adder. Mm -hmm. This one is actually a female. And this is about as large as they grow. They don't grow much bigger than this. So it looks like a puff adder. You can see it's got these little horns above its head mm -hmm. that gives it its name. So this Kenya horn viper is found in Naivasha, mm -hmm. in and around the Kinin Kop. Right. In fact, anywhere where the Leleshwa bush grows, mm -hmm. this, this snake has adapted to eat mice in that area. Oh, wow. And the problem is at the moment, except for Nakuru National Park in Hell's Gate, is the only part of its, of its extension that is within a protected area. Right. So lots of flower farming in the Naivasha area, etc., over the years has actually destroyed this snake's habitat. And so they are very, very rare indeed. Another snake that is the, 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 a Kenyan viper that is rare is the Kenya, this is the Mount Kenya bush viper. Mm -hmm. And bush vipers live in, 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 as their name suggests, in bushes and trees. I'm going to get him out so that you can have a look. 
you'll see I'm using um, a pair of tongs here so that oh. it doesn't 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 grab hold of me. I hope it doesn't grab gonna, hold of me. I'm just going to put him on the bush here so that you can see. Okay. So this beautiful black whoa, and, whoa, and whoa. gold viper is actually only found in two places on Mount Kenya, around Chuka, mm -hmm. on the southeastern slope of Mount Kenya, and and in at a place called Igembe in the Nyambenis. And there's nowhere else in the world that you will find this viper. And so for us, it's a problem because both those areas are not protected. Mm -hmm. um, a huge problem with, with, with our vipers and a lot of our snakes in Kenya has been illegal export. And so it's important to conserve, as I said, not just the species, but the habitat in its area, etc. Well, what are some of the major threats facing snakes here in Kenya and around the world? Well, first of all is ignorance. So many people are unaware that, you know, as I said, there are very many, ve you know, snakes of which only a few of them are venomous. And people may have the idea, oh, why don't we just kill all the venomous snakes and then we'll have nothing to worry about. The biggest problem is that you, you will never kill them all. Conservation is important everywhere and we've, we've done really well with, with our initiative Saving Snakes, it's very popular. I found that children and young people at schools are a key. So going to the schools, talking to them about conservation and about snake bite so that they're aware, it ends up making a difference because the old, older community are just not, not prepared to embrace it. And well, some might argue, you know, what is the importance of snakes? You talked about the fact that snakes, you know, eat a lot of rats and mice, so they help clean up. But why should someone who's watching care about snakes? Well, that's actually exactly why. If, if you have a, we, we have an area where they, they systematically killed every snake in that, in that area. And the, after two, three years, the number of snakes that has increased, um, has, I mean, the number of rats that has increased has, has, has gone tenfold. So half the harvest has been lost just because of rats. It's, it's a real, real problem. In areas where people have learned to identify the snakes, tolerate one, gets out the snake handler in the area to say, oh, this is not a dangerous snake, don't worry about it. And then people learn them. They have done really well. There's two sides to this. One is conserving them because there is a benefit from you. And then there's conserving them because it's the right thing to do. So conserving snakes really, really is critical. And no doubt everybody needs to play their role. You do have some more snakes that you want to show me. Um, we've seen one that looks beautiful in color, but you've got a surprise. There are some other really pretty snakes. I'd like to show you a, a, a snake just now that, that we'll see what you think about it. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll show you. Yeah. All right, let's go. So Smriti, what I'd like to do is I'd like to show you um, something wow. that I think is very unique to this, this part of Kenya. That is a bright blue snake. It is, that's the idea. They're quite fast moving. This is one of the spotted bush snakes. Uh -huh. And this is not venomous. This is not venomous. Wow, I've never seen or heard of a blue snake. Whoa. So in nature, most of them are green. And as you can see, the one in, in this cage, I'll see if I can get one out of here to show you. There's two of them in there, I see. There's more than two, so ah, I'm okay. just trying to, trying to get one out. But these ones cannot bite, will not bite. Oh! Okay, I got him. That was... Well, they can't, they do bite. Okay. As you see, that one is quite, but let him just calm down, I'll show you. Uh huh. <clears throat> I think I need to calm down. To, once he calms down, so <laughs> yeah. that this, this, these snakes are, are, are very common here. This one was actually collected this morning in one of the, one of the trees down the road. Okay. But what I like to do, I'm just going to be very gentle here because when, when you first catch a snake, venomous or not, often they will, they will, they will make an attempt to, to try and bite you to defend themselves. So you can see it's slowly calming down here. So the green one is the normal color of okay. this species of snake. Oh! So we've got these two, two snakes here. One is obviously blue yeah. and the other one is green. So green is camouflage. Yeah, but how does the blue one then survive or protect itself? That's a really good point. And for a long time, nobody knew. But over the years that we've tried to study them as best as we can, we found we get more blue ones in the mangroves. Ah. Now, here's an interesting thing. Towards certain dry season of the year, the mangroves have a lot of yellow leaves. So mm -hmm. you would have assumed being yellow yeah. would be a positive thing to do. So there's certain parts um, up the other side of the sabaki where there are mangroves and we do get green mambas there that are yellow and okay. they've benefited from having the yellow leaves. Right. And I couldn't understand why is this blue snake survived in the mangroves yeah. when the others haven't. But I took a flight with a friend 
and flew over the over the creek and I noticed the first thing is that the creek looks blue because it's bouncing off the off the blue sky. Right. So what happens is whether you're a bird from the sky looking down mm -hmm. or whether you're an animal below looking up, you're you're bouncing the blue color of the sky or the creek off it. And that's why we believe that the the the, the, the these spotted bush snakes that we find in around Meadow Creek and the mangrove areas have actually benefited. It's from like that. looking right at me. <laughs> a lot of these get killed because people will say, oh, that's a green mamba. Yeah. Um, and so kill it. Okay. And in fact, in places like uh, Nairobi and so you get a similar snake call, called a Battersby's green snake. We used to call them grass snakes when I was growing up in that area. They're totally harmless. Mm. And so people will kill it because it's a green mamba and yet it can't do anybody any harm. So this one. You may say, okay, there's no, there's no benefit from it because it's not eating our rats. Yeah. But for me, I look at it like a butterfly. You've got it's, this beautiful yeah, animal it is that deserves its place. Yeah. Why, why would we go and kill it when there's this pretty snake going up and down the... And it's harmless. And it's completely harmless. And it's normal to have fear like you do, to be like that. Yeah. I mean, it's taken me years to get to know these animals and, and each person that we train. But it is a natural reaction to be scared of snakes sure. like, like you do. And, and why is that though? Why are people just naturally afraid of snakes? Part of the problem in Africa, which many people in the West will not understand, is almost every village you go to, you will meet someone that has either lost a, a leg or has they know of a family member who has yeah. died from a horrendous snake bite and taken a long time to die. And something like that, you can't go and tell people like that to understand that easily. Of and course. yet at the end of the day, once you do and you show them the difference and they realize it's not poisonous, so especially in in areas where people, you know, their 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 tribal backgrounds were hunter gatherers, mm. they have names for the different species. Try and get these fast fellows. All right. In so here. as Ryan puts those, I gotta say, beautiful snakes <laughs> back. Mm. That's what um, you like. I think it's possibly my turn now to try and hold a snake. I really don't know how I feel about that, but I cannot leave Bioken without holding a snake. So what are you going to give me? Jerry, can you bring us a house snake, please? All right, so a house snake is on its way. And speaking of a house snake, as uh, she brings it over, uh, many people have Thank asked you. questions about keeping snakes as pets. Is that encouraged? Is that a good thing, a bad thing? I think it, we've got to be very reserved with that. You know, somebody who's keeping a venomous snake at home because he wants to be cool, yeah. he rides heavy motorcycles and wants a puff at it, I don't think is a good idea. Sure. And then from there, once we've, we've usually spoken with someone's parents that they are really interested in this, I, I, I think it's very unfair to put that light out on a, on a young conservationist yeah. who, who's keen on that. Okay. In my opinion, Almost all the people I know that are really good at reptiles today started a life by keeping a little snake and looking after yeah. it. And But like anything, if you're going to keep, whether you keep a, a cat or, or a snake, you have to look after it and make sure that you, you, you keep it well, you feed it and things like that. So the house snake gets its name because it comes into people's houses. Okay. And that's what, what frightens people. But it's actually a really good snake to know because they eat a lot of rats and mice. Um, like this one, they, they, they actually become quite gentle in nature and, and, and we, can, we can give you this one to try and, and hold if you, if you like. Would you like to? Um, yeah, okay, so what, do I, what are the do's and don'ts? Well, don't squeeze it. So okay. if I just gave you Wait, my hand, yeah. put your hand out like you're about to pick it up. So okay. basically hold it like that and, 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 and it'll probably slither around. Now remember, the first thing its head is going to do is move like that because it doesn't have any hands. So I'll make sure that it doesn't climb up your arm, but don't worry if the head comes because it's just putting its chin because it doesn't have an arm. So it's not trying yeah. to bite you. Yeah. Its natural reaction is to come back onto that. Okay, so wait. So what we'll do, yeah. I'll start with you hold the tail like we did before. Yeah, but um, so what if I get freaked out? Then do just I let go tell me that you're uncomfortable and I will take it And this it off one you. will not bite me. Well, it shouldn't do because it's, <laughs> okay, it's been in it captivity for a long time <laughs> oh and it's never Lord, given okay. us any problem. Okay. But what we'll do is I'll start by holding the head and then oh. you can hold the body and take it from there. Okay. This is the moment that everybody's been waiting for. Right, so I just hold it like this. Yes. Oh man. Okay, sorry. This is taking a bit of a moment. Um, as you can imagine, this isn't something easy to do. I'm scared, Roy. Okay. All right, we just had to pause for a moment because I needed a breather before I actually held that snake. Uh, I've had a chat with Roy now. He has um, made me a little bit more confident that I will be okay, but we have changed the snake, Roy. This is a different one. 
Tell us, what is this? Well, I've changed the snake, one, because it's taking so long to hold it that the poor snake is getting tired. Um, poor snake, but I've also, to, to help encourage you to hold the snake, yeah. is I, I've picked an egg-eating snake. This is a snake that has no teeth. Mm -hmm. It only eats chicken, well, it eats bird's eggs. We feed the, our bigger ones on, on chicken eggs. Mm -hmm. They also do not bite, because they, okay. if they do, they give away that they can't defend themselves. And so it's a snake that I can promise you, I promise you this snake cannot, cannot, cannot bite you. Okay. So what you've got to do now is to deal with yourself, because yep. all of Kenya is watching you, <laughs> yeah. is to actually pull yourself together that you can hold a snake yeah. by yourself. Are you going to try? I'm going to do it. God be with me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure once I actually do it, it's not even going to be that big a deal. But it might be. So this is an East African egg-eating snake. It's got this beautiful grey colour and it, they, they've got these lovely little white markings on the back. Um, you'll see the skin is also quite rough compared to other snakes. Okay. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to give you half the snake and see whether you, whether you can manage with that. That's it. And if you just take the tail so that you can support it. Don't worry if the tail... <laughs> it has no arms, so all it's doing... Is slithering yeah, around. That's okay. So I whoa, 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 what are you okay. doing? No, 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 I'm just, I'm still here. Ah, oh, okay, so what I'm feeling by making these noises is I'm feeling the snake sort of slithering on my arm and around me, but, but I, I think I can, I can do it. It's just a very strange, unusual feeling. Ah, and I'm doing it. If you lift your thumb a little bit just to uh -huh. give her something to support her. Okay. There we go. All right, there we go. So I'm, I'm good right now. Um, this is an interesting sensation, I've got to say. I think if she starts rolling up my I'm arm... I'm right here, don't <laughs> worry. Wow, so this snake is harmless. But of course, nobody should just um, pick, try pick up a snake at all. What are the do's and don'ts if you see a snake? You mentioned that people should call you and we will share out your contacts. But if, if they can't get hold of somebody, what should they do? Well, we would say if you see a snake like this on the kitchen floor, you know, get a broom and sweep it outside. Just, just you don't need to kill it. Just let it go. It's, it's not doing anybody any harm, you know. Um, and, and, and really encourage people. I certainly think it's very important not to try and pick it up. Okay. Um, you know, because if you make a mistake and pick up a venomous snake, you can be in a lot of problems. Yeah. But um, it's, it's, it's just a wild animal and, and it's just got lost and it's in the wrong oh! place. No, oh! Don't worry, don't worry. I'm right here. Okay. It's behaving, but now it's coming closer no, to me. No, it's not. It's okay. fine. All right. Okay. I think I'm done. All right. Well yeah, done. There we go. Very proud of you. <laughs> Slowly. Okay. Okay. Coiling around me. Yeah. Well okay. done. All right. So I've held a snake. And I know you're probably thinking that it looks so easy. It's not a big deal. But you try. Come over to BioCan and see. That fear really does get to you. But Royan does really make it much easier. And once you learn the importance of snakes and how beautiful they are and how much they need protecting, I'm sure that you will be holding a snake uh, next time you visit. And there it is, look, crawling over you and you're just okay with it. <laughs> All right, well, at this point we have learned so much about snakes and it is time to bring you our wild guess question. List three of the most venomous types of snakes in Kenya. List three of the most venomous types of snakes in Kenya. To participate, just like the NTV Wild Facebook page. Only answers posted on the timeline post that's associated with this question will be considered. The first person to answer correctly wins a voucher for a truly delightful, relaxing and uplifting spa experience at the Shiangiki Spa, a small haven of sheer wellness, serenity and bliss located at Karen Connection. Plus, free entry for four people and a vehicle to any national park of your choice courtesy of the Kenya Wildlife Service, one bottle of wine courtesy of Wines of the World and a gift hamper courtesy of Wildlife Direct. Terms and conditions apply and can be found on the NTV Wild Facebook page. Last week's lucky winner was Maria Minaj. And now here is our Wild Pick segment. Amos Kimanzi sent in this photo taken at the Nairobi National Park. It was a selfie with friends and he says that friends were visiting for a week and going on a game drive was on their agenda. They wanted to enjoy the best that Kenyan wildlife has to offer. Green Spandula was with his cousin Beryl. They were at the KWS Safari Walk and they took a selfie with this lovely giraffe in the background. They were there for their love for wildlife. 
Job Oino was at the Ololua Nature Trail. He was out for a walk along the trail and says that he loves adventure and the natural environment. At Lake Ellis at the foot of Mount Kenya was Julius Muriki. He was posing by the lake and he was there during a hike on Mount Kenya. Marvin Morangu was at the Ramoy National Reserve in Elgeo Maraquet County and this was a selfie snap with elephants in the background. Marvin says he had gone to visit because I just love wild animals and nature. If you want your photo showcased on our Wild Pick segment, just like our NTV Wild Facebook page, send in a good quality photo that shows you celebrating nature via private message. Include your full name, tell us where the photo was taken, what you were doing and why. Well, this is the biggest ever snake that I have seen in real life. I mean, there are 10 of us holding on to this African rock python. Royan, I mean, this is incredible. Yeah, they're, they're, they're really big snakes. In fact, um, they, are, they are the largest snake in Africa by far. They, they grow to around 20 feet. They have been recorded in the past to be more than that. Um, we certainly um, have caught them up to and around 18 feet. This is a 16 foot snake here. She weighs about 25 to 28 kilos. Um, luckily, they are fully protected in Kenya now. A snake like this is probably about 70 or 80 years old. Oh, wow. um, so what tends to happen is they live in areas where th th there, there are people and sooner or later, as I explained earlier, when, once they get to this size, you know, they're not compatible with where people are living. They'll eat their livestock, their, their animals, and, mm -hmm. and they, they can become very dangerous as a result. So we request people to please not kill them. If you find a snake like this, to contact us, and we'll make every effort to come there, catch that snake, and relocate it in the wild. We have a few like this to show people, but generally most of the pythons that we catch, we relocate them back into the national parks right. or into the wild somewhere where they can live out their lives properly. I have never met anybody, Royan, like you who has such a passion for snakes. What you and your entire team of men and women are doing here really is impressive. Never did I think I would get this close to a snake. I mean, look at it. It is just absolutely fascinating and these creatures must be protected. They are under threat and you can always do your bit. For more information, log on to wwwbio ken Com. Well, that's it on NTV Wild Talk with me, Smriti Vidyarthi, coming to you from Bioken Snake Farm, handling snakes. And you know what? I would do this all over again. <laughs> Thanks very much. See you next Tuesday at 10 p.m. All right. Whoa. Right. Snake? <laughs> <laughs> I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. I'm here, I'm here. I'm here. I'm NTV World Tour coming to you from the Bioken snake farm here. Put the cobra down. It thinks that the camera lens is a hole, so it goes straight to it. NTV Wild Talk in partnership with the Kenya Wildlife Service and Wildlife Direct.